And happy Resurrection Day, as we said. Um, what a great day to be together to, to celebrate and remember the ultimate victory of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, over sin and over death. And this morning, I, wanna, I want us to try to consider or perhaps reconsider uh, the true and mind-blowing reality of the resurrection and what that means for each and every one of us. Um, and to do so, we're going to spend time in John's Gospel again. You'll remember we were in John's Gospel last Sunday for Palm Sunday in John chapter 12. And today, I'd love us to, to read the entirety of John chapter 20, uh, where we see a number of interactions on that first resurrection day and indeed the week that follows. And so, Joel, if you could flick my computer on for me there, please, that would be brilliant. And if you were here last week, um, I raised the question, what do you see? And, it, what, what, and that was based on the account in John 12 as Jesus was entering Jerusalem on a donkey's colt with crowds cheering him into the city as the potential Messiah Yet many in the crowd didn't see him correctly. And so they responded wrongly to him. And so as the first Holy Week played out, it was clear that Jesus wasn't the military political leader that many hoped him to be. And in fact, rather than overthrowing the Romans who were occupying the land, by the end of the week, Jesus had been crucified by them. And so this man surely couldn't be the promised one. He couldn't be the Messiah. He couldn't be the one to come and save God's people, surely. And so many in the crowd who had seen him riding into Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday turned their cries from Hosanna on Sunday to crucify him on Friday. Some of the crowd didn't see him rightly, and so they responded to him wrongly. However, there were some in the crowd who did see the reality of what was going on on that first Palm Sunday. As Jesus sat on the colt riding into Jerusalem in humility, surely there were some who saw the connection with the prophet Zechariah. This was yet another prophecy that Jesus was fulfilling of the Messiah, the coming one. Surely he could be the one who God was sending. And of course, he is the one who can rule. He is the one who can save. He is the one who can redeem. Some did see him correctly. And so they saw him even as he came to humble himself as a sacrifice for sin. They saw him as, yes, he could be the Messiah. Yes, he is the Messiah. And so they rightly respond to him by trusting in him. And I'm sure that that still brought questions and doubts for them as, as they watched him die on that Good Friday. Indeed, we're told throughout the Gospels how many of the disciples deserted him. There were questions and fears. Even though they trusted in him, they didn't understand what was going on. But of course, as Barry has so helpfully said, Good Friday is not the end of the Christian story. Sunday was coming. Sunday is here. And now as we read John's account of that first Easter Sunday, again, we want to ask, what do you see? Time and time again throughout John 20. In fact, I wonder if you noticed time and time again through the songs we've been singing, we've seen that word, see. See Mary weeping as she turns from the tomb. See what is going on. And throughout John 20, we'll see multiple references to what the followers of Jesus saw, what they were looking for. And so we will again ask, well, what did they see and how did they respond to what they saw? And so for hearers of this wondrous account again, almost 2,000 years later, we'll ask the same two questions. What do you see as you look at Easter Sunday morning, as you look at the empty tomb, what do you see and how will you respond? And so as I said, I want to, want to read the entirety of John chapter 20. It might take us a minute, but this is a wonderful, wonderful account as we see not just that first Resurrection Sunday, but indeed the week that followed on. So let's read together John chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. 
They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am, send, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them what he had said, these, that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where, na where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. It's an amazing chapter, isn't it? And, and each interaction uh, would be worth exploring fuller, and I would encourage you to do so this week. But seeing the big picture like this in one sweep, I'd simply like us to see the invitation from the text this morning, to see and believe. Mary, Peter, the other disciples, including John and Thomas, they all see and they all believe. They see the resurrected Lord. And because of what they see, they respond with belief. Now, perhaps you can instantly see a difficulty here that many of us, if not all of us, I think, haven't physically seen the resurrected Lord. And so how can we believe? If the invitation is to see and believe, well, if we can't see, then how can we believe? Maybe this sounds great for the first disciples, but, but I've got questions like Thomas. But look at what Jesus says about us and the millions who have followed him since when he speaks to Thomas in verse 29. Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen. Jesus knew there would be millions who would believe without seeing. And rather than pitying us, for that, rather than hoping that we can overcome that potential stumbling block, he calls us blessed. In other words, as ecstatically happy as I'm sure all of us would have been to have been there on that first Easter morning or on one of the many occasions afterwards where Jesus physically appears to his disciples before returning to heaven, we can be encouraged and comforted by the reality that physical sight of the resurrected Lord is not a requirement for belief. Jesus said so. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. That belief is just as valid as those who had seen. Rather, in the place of sight, as 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, we live by faith, 
not by sight. But be assured, people, friends, church, be assured, that faith is not blind faith. It's not a shot in the dark. It's not pie in the sky hopes and dreams. That faith that we walk by is solid ground. It is solid ground on which we can stand upon because of Resurrection Sunday. We can have faith because we may not physically see Jesus standing in front of us resurrected. But he has given us his word, which is true, capital T, for eternity true. And so we can see with the eyes of faith. And we can see and believe that this is indeed true. We can see the empty tomb. We can see the transformed disciples. We can see the risen Lord. Therefore, believe. Don't we see that from how John finishes this chapter with indeed this purpose statement for his whole gospel in verse 30 and 31? When he finishes off by saying, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in in this book, but these are written. In other words, I have written this gospel and recorded everything here under the inspiration of God so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so this book is written in order that we might understand who Jesus is and we might see him for who he truly is, the Messiah, the Son of God, and therefore believe. We see and believe. And through that belief, we have life in his name. And so then, what do we see through John chapter 20? What do we see and therefore how does that impact our belief? What do we, and will we believe what we see indeed? Well, firstly, let's think of Mary Magdalene. In verse 1, we're told that Mary Magdalene is the first one to see anything in this chapter. Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance in verse 1. And this stone was, of course, the one that had been rolled across the entrance to the tomb in which Jesus had been placed. We know from Matthew's gospel and also from Mark's that Mary Magdalene was there on Good Friday when they placed Jesus into this tomb. She had seen where he had had been placed. She had watched them roll the stone. She knew where she was going on Easter Sunday morning. And as she approaches the tomb, she sees that something is different. The stone is gone. But why? What did that mean? Well, it's clear from verse 2, and indeed what she says later on in verse 11, from verse 11 on, that Mary believes her first instinct is to think, someone has taken his body. They have taken the body of my Lord. And so she runs to get Simon Peter and the other disciple, who, who we know is John. And again, they then go and explore what's happening. We'll deal with them in a minute. But in verse 11, we, re- we return to Mary, where again, she's standing weeping at the tomb. She's still caught in this emotional turmoil of where have they put my Lord? And she sees the angels. Then, indeed, after that, we see her then encountering this man who she at first doesn't recognize in the garden. And from her words, we can tell that she is still preoccupied and consumed by this worry of where have they put the body of my Lord? And so in verse 15, Jesus, she doesn't know that yet. Jesus asks her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. And so she's seen the stone rolled away. And assume that that means that someone has taken his body and she is desperate to see Jesus again. And of course, she can't at this stage recognize who it is that she is talking to until we get to verse 16. This man is not the gardener. This man is the risen Jesus Christ. And so at verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Rabbi, teacher, it's you. Let's not skip over the, the implication here that Mary was looking for Jesus and he knew where she was all along. She might have been looking for him, but he knew where she was. And so when she turned to him and recognized him for who he is, he was there all along, ready to receive her. She had seen the stone rolled away. She had seen the empty tomb. And these things had only brought questions and fears and indeed tears. But now she sees the Lord and is filled then with certainty and with courage. 
So much so that verse 18, she goes back to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. And so Mary is the first witness to the resurrected Jesus. And she's quick to share that message. She has seen the Lord. She responds with faith. She responds with action. She responds with courage. Because she has seen and believed. That's Mary's part of John 20. What about Peter and John and indeed the other disciples? Well, verse 3 to 10 tell us of how Peter and John are the first to go to the tomb. They see this empty cavern where Jesus' body had been laid. They see the grave clothes. They see the evidence of everything that Mary had told them. And they're deeply impacted. Then we see the disciples gathered from verse 19 on. We see them gathered on the evening of the first day. They're, they're still in fear of the Jewish leaders. And so effectively they're hiding. And suddenly, miraculously, Jesus appears before them. And at the second half of verse 19, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. I think it's just, it's just mind-blowing to try to place yourself in that room, isn't it? In the midst of the fear and doubt and questions and what on earth were the last three years all about? If Jesus is dead, then where does that leave us? But what about Mary? Look at what she is saying. How about Peter and John? They say the tomb is empty. What's going on? And then Jesus is there. The risen Jesus with nail marks in his hands and a hole in his side, which they know is from his definite death on the cross that they witnessed on Friday. He's there. Resurrected, risen before them. And their response is joy. They are overjoyed to have saw the Lord. And so they see they believe, and their response is joy. But, but the disciples weren't all there on that first evening. And I love the fact that Thomas is one of the disciples, and I love that his story is recorded for us in God's Word. Because Thomas just cannot get his head around it. Regardless of what everyone else has said, it just doesn't make sense to me. And so as we see from verse 24 and 25, now Thomas, also called Didymus, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Thomas is skeptical. He needs proof. He wasn't there. He hasn't seen. And everyone can say whatever they want unless he sees. He will not believe. His belief is conditional on certain things happening before he can make that jump. And I'm sure you know people who say exactly the same thing. Indeed, maybe you're one of them. Particularly when it comes to the Christian faith. You see the validity in the statements of the Christian faith, maybe. You see the impact that it's had on people you know and love. But when it comes to, to you and whether you believe, there's an unless. Unless I fill in the blank, I will not believe. And whatever that unless condition might be for you, take heart from the fact that Thomas was just the same. Now, of course, Thomas's condition is met here. He does see the Lord. He sees the nails. He's able to put his finger where the nails were. He put his, puts his, is able to put his hand on his side. The interesting thing is we're not told that he does. Jesus invites him to. We simply hear Jesus' invitation in verse 27. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side, stop doubting and believe. And, and it's no coincidence that Jesus exactly almost repeats Thomas's unless. Thomas had said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, unless I put my finger where the nails had been, unless I put my hand in his side. And so Jesus comes to him and says, see my hands, put your finger where, my nail, where the nails were. See my side, put your hand where, the, the, where there's a hole in my side. See, Jesus hadn't been physically there when Thomas had raised all these questions with the disciples. But the all-knowing, all-powerful, crucified, yet risen Savior knew. He knew Thomas. And so if, if you find yourself saying, unless something i cannot i will not believe 
And here's confirmation that God knows your questions. He's not afraid of you asking them of him. And he invites you to come and see so that you may believe. And we're not told whether Thomas did put his hands on the physical Jesus. All we're told is what Thomas Thomas says in verse 28. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. No one else could do this. No one else could tell exactly what I needed. And you have, Lord, look, you are risen. I watched you die and now you are here alive. Surely you are my Lord and my God. And so here we have in verse, chapter 20 of John's gospel, these miraculous encounters, Mary, Peter, John, and the other disciples, and Thomas. And the one thing that unites them all is that they see and believe. And so as we worked our way through the chapter, we're back to where we began in verse 29. And Jesus said because, to Thomas, because you have seen me and believed, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And so if, if you don't believe yet, welcome we're delighted you're here or listening and as you do we pray that this easter sunday morning would be the day that you see that you see jesus's death in your place taking the penalty of sin upon himself you see him now as the risen and victorious savior you see him as the one who died so that all who believe in him would know eternal joy eternal freedom eternal peace eternal protection from god's wrath Life in all its fullness. May you come to see. And therefore may you believe. And for those who do believe. Who who know this risen Jesus. And can say therefore with Thomas. My Lord and my God. Let me share some truths. Which may be familiar to you. Familiar to you. But they are oh so important. See, as as we believers celebrate Resurrection Day, it's good to be reminded what the resurrection means for us as believers. And so I was listening to a podcast this week, which I found very helpful. And the the podcast episode was just entitled 10 Results of the Resurrection. It's not an exclusive list, but it's certainly a great place to start in God's word. And so I've printed them out here for everyone to take one home. I would love you to do that. Take them home, read the, the verses that are referenced. But here are the 10 things Uh, that were mentioned on this podcast. Ten results of the resurrection. Firstly, a savior who could never die again. What does the resurrection mean? It means that Jesus died once and once for all for sin. In Romans 6 verse 9 we read, we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Secondly, repentance. In Acts 5, 30 and 31, We read, the God of our ancestors, as Peter is explaining, God of the ancestors raised Christ from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on the cross. God exalted him to his own right hand as the prince and savior that he might bring Israel to repentance and forgive their sins. And so the resurrection means repentance. Thirdly, new birth. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead in 1 Peter 1, 3. Through the resurrection of the dead, he has caused us to be born again. Number four, forgiveness of sin from 1 Corinthians 15. If Christ had not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Paul goes on through that chapter in verse 20 to then say, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Therefore, the opposite of verse 17 is also true, that you are not in your sins anymore. He has forgiven them from those who believe. Fifthly, the Holy Spirit. In Acts 2, Again, Peter speaking, said, This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this, that you yourselves may see our seeing and hearing. And so as the Holy Spirit fell at Pentecost, Peter stands up to say, Because Christ is raised from the dead, God the Father has given him the Holy Spirit, whom he has poured out upon his people, and that is what you're seeing, and that is a result of the resurrection. Number six, there are now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. In Romans 8, 34, who is, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. So he was raised and he is the one who will sit in the ultimate judgment seat. And for those who are in him, there is no condemnation. 
Seventhly, Jesus' personal fellowship and protection. As he is leaving his disciples in Matthew 28, 20, he promises them, I am with you always to the end of the age. Number eight, there is proof of God's coming judgment. In Acts 17, we read, God has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Number nine, salvation from the future wrath of God. We read these verses in 1 Thessalonians a few months ago. We wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. And finally, a result of the resurrection is our own resurrection from the dead. In 2 Corinthians 4.14, we read, We know that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. And so we see the centrality of the Easter weekend. As humanity, we need this story. We need Good Friday because we need our sins to be dealt with. We need that penalty to be paid lest we pay it it ourselves, which is the wrath of God for all eternity. But because Jesus came, as the atoning sacrifice to die in our place and take that penalty upon himself, then to not be crushed by death, but rather rise in victory over it. Oh, we can know that his promise of forgiveness is secure. We can know that he has indeed, as John 14 says, gone to prepare a place for us who are in him. And so there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so in belief and in trust and repentance of sin and in turning to Christ, we can know the life that he has for us. And that life goes way beyond this one. And there we have hope. There we have security. There we can trust. There we can walk by faith and not by sight. Because blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And so we pray that indeed this would be a day where many see and believe. We see the resurrected Savior and we believe in who he is and all that he said and the reality that he is coming again. And may that fill the hearts of every believer with joy, with confidence, with peace as we seek to live for him. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for Resurrection Sunday. We thank you for your incredible power that raised Christ from the dead. Oh, we praise you, Lord, for the wonderful gift of Jesus Christ, for the salvation that you have offered to all who turn to him in faith. And so we pray that for those of us who have done that, who have trusted you as our Lord and Savior, Father, would you send us out from this place emboldened by your spirit, confident in the life that you call us to, and Lord, for those who, who are yet to come to that saving knowledge of you, Lord, would you, would you help, help them to see? Help them to see and believe that you are indeed Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the promised one, the one who saves. And so we thank you. And we pray that you would be honored and glorified as we gather around your table in a moment. It's in your wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen.